All right, welcome everyone to the Civic Camps Citizens Ward 2 Councillor Forum. Thank you very much for attending tonight and showing an interest in the issues that shape our city. My name is Priscilla Cherry, I'm with Fresh FM Online Radio, and I will be your moderator this evening. For those of you who are not familiar with Civic Camp, we are a nonpartisan public advocacy group that enables citizens to engage in creating a city that works for all of us. So you can all visit Civic Camp org to learn more and join the great organization. So first I'd like to thank um, our generous sponsors and Civic Camp volunteers who have donated their time to make tonight's event a reality. I'd also like to thank our hosts for tonight, the Royal Oak Victory Church, and uh, they've donated their venue, so thank you very much. And the Calgary Foundation for their generous donation, the Calgary Sound Rentals, and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing tonight's equipment. And I'd also like to thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary for helping out uh, get the word out about the farms. Also, a big thanks to Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for their support with the School Board Trustees Citizens Forums, as well, there's a lot of us to thank tonight, Students Association of Mount Royal University, and finally, the University of Calgary Students Union. And of course, I'd like to thank the candidates and for all of you tonight for joining us. So I'm just going to go over some uh, ground rules. Civic campers have named these forums citizen forums, so it is not a debate. Um, the first half of the questions will be um, sourced from Calgarians at large, thanks to UserVoice.com. And <clears throat> sorry, we have asked Calgarians what questions they would like to be asked at these forums. So they have voted on what is most important. So the top vote getting questions will be asked tonight. And so this is how um, basically it's going to work. All the candidates will be asked roughly four questions, hopefully more if, we, if the time allows. And they will be provided two minutes each to respond. And the candidates will be asked to respond each question Sorry, the question will be drawn, they will be drawn randomly. So I'll have my little chips here and they have their chips. So it's not pre-planned or anything. And because we cannot have every candidate answer every question, we would provide the opportunity for each candidate to answer their question and they would have a minute to offer their response. I will ask, I will invite you after the candidates have answered their question, then I will invite anyone else to um, offer their own response. And that's when you use the chip and throw it in the cup, and I'll be watching, so no cheating. <laughs> and so to ensure, we ask some more ward-specific questions as well. Everyone in the audience is invited to um, help yourself to the striped box just at the back there, and you can fill out um, some questions tonight at all, whatever you want to ask the candidates, and we will decide them at intermission. And um, yeah, so that just gives you a chance to voice whatever you want to say, and you can provide them to myself or to my supporters at the front. And also on that note, I just want to remind the candidates some rules of etiquette for tonight. Uh, please respect the clock, deliver your statements in the time provided. There's the bright red clock right there. And please do not interrupt the other candidates when they speak. Please stay focused on the issue. Again, it's a forum, not a debate, so please avoid any personal references or criticisms uh, directed to your fellow candidates. And lastly, let the audience decide. We ask the supporters to leave their signs outside the room um, where campaigning is encouraged. And of course, we welcome applauses, um, but any other interruptions from campaigners on the floor will not be allowed. So um, at, this, at this time, I'd also like to introduce our candidates by allowing them two minutes to tell a little bit about themselves. And we'll just start uh, right here with Terry and we'll work down. So first up, please welcome Terry Wong. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, everybody. It's a privilege and honor to be here today. It's a privilege and honor to represent the folks in the Ward 2 uh, District of uh, City of Calgary. Uh, a bit about myself, I've been a resident of the Northwest Calgary area in, uh, for the last 30 odd years, so I pretty much know a lot of the, uh, uh, the development that's ha happened in the area. I've also been a member of the City of Calgary uh, administration for the last 29 years as a manager uh, for the last 18 years. So I understand the issues and challenges that face the Ward 2 area, both from the community perspective, the administrative perspective, and certainly over the last uh, years of uh, doing a lot of community volunteer work, I understand it from your perspective. Um, 
One of the things I'd like to also introduce as well is that uh, this was to be my final year at the city and, uh, and I decided to retire. So then, uh, for those that know me through my city experience, um, will know that I've done a lot of work through the variety of different uh, departments. Uh, out of the six departments, worked out of five different departments there. And out of those five different departments, I've worked in a variety of senior, senior executive uh, sort of issues there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And next, I'll invite uh, Mr. Bernie Dowan. Oh, Dohan, sorry. Mr. Bernie Dohan. <laughs> A wise man once said it best, leadership is a privilege to better the lives of others. It is not an opportunity to satisfy personal greed. Greetings, I am Bernie Dohan, and I am here to demonstrate that I too believe that leadership is a privilege to better the lives of others. Born in Calgary, I know Calgary. I love Calgary. I want to make Calgary better. I want to make Calgary better for everyone, young and older, male and female, poverty-stricken and wealthy, dogs and cats, and especially families. I'm married to my wife, Michelle, and we have two wonderful children, Grady, seven, and Taylor, four. They'd like to be here tonight, but it's uh, hockey season, and Mr. Ripley knows what that's like with hockey season, so. I live in the Ward 2 community of Citadel for the last nine years, unlike a few of the candidates here tonight who do not live in Ward 2, but want to represent us. By trade, I'm a school teacher, usually junior high social studies, but I have the ability to teach phys ed, science, math, and English. Just don't ask me to teach art. That would be setting up a generation of future stickman artists for failure in the future. In my spare time, I love to be active. I enjoy the sports of rugby, golf, and hockey. I love spending time with my family, going hiking, especially to Nose Hill Park and the K Country. I've volunteered for many organizations, including the Citadel Community Association, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and the Calgary Rugby Union. Folks, I'm running for the right reasons. The wise man who I quoted earlier stated, this is an opportunity to, set, to satisfy personal greed, not to satisfy personal greed. I'm the candidate who will listen. I'm the candidate who will act on your behalf. I will get things done. One last thing. I see the time is up, sorry. <laughs> I'm backed by people like you, my friends, family, neighbors, small business owners. I listen to all good ideas, from the right, the center, the left. If it's cost effective and makes sense, I will support it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Dohan. And next, I will invite uh, Mr. Joe Maglioka. Excellent, thank you. Mike Bernie, I also. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Mike Bernie, I also live in uh, Ward Two. I've been there since uh, 1999 in the Hamptons. Also, the uh, president of the Hampton Association for the past seven years. So I'm really familiar of all uh, the uh, events and all the. Um, um, what is happenings in our communities. Uh, for being with the president of Ward 2 also involved me to know what's happening in, uh, in Citadel and Arbor Lake and, and uh, Evanston all throughout our community. We had monthly meetings with Gord Lowe and um, so I got involved in all the community. Um, uh, my name is Joe and I am um, also an executive at the airport and uh, looking at budgets and living within our means is what it means to me. That's my family, we do the same thing. And uh, we like to bring that attitude also to city council. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Sean Ripley. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Sean Ripley, and I believe it. Ward 2 has been represented by a very strong and experienced individual, and I'd like to carry on that tradition of experience within the ward. City Hall is a very complex place, and you don't learn it in a day. 
It's taken me over a decade of working in and around City Hall and five years on a uh, expert panel and commission of council to actually learn the ropes at City Hall. Bringing that experience uh, to the ward uh, would allow me to actually serve immediately the, the citizens of the ward. I'm a native Calgarian. I'm passionate about this place. I am a fourth generation Calgarian. I remember stories that my dad would tell of uh, supervising the pouring of the Calgary Tower and I've also been involved with the approvals and design and finalization of some of the larger towers that now are in, in our downtown skyline. I have a small business experience. I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, involved in a number of endeavors where we actually put uh, business success together. And I am a, a part of this ward. I grew up in Northwest Calgary and uh, over on the Pascapu Slopes and am part of this community. The roots are deep within, within Calgary for me and I'm a community builder. I was a member of the Calgary Planning Commission and I was nominated there by the Federation of Calgary Communities and I have that community experience and I would like to continue that tradition of experience within the ward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley, and thank you all the candidates for your lovely introductions. Um, so we'd like to get started now, the first round of questions. So um, the first question is for Mr. Bernie and Mr. Sean Ripley. So the question that I have is, with a vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in YYC? And go ahead, Mr. Ripley. Well, I think, thank you for the question. I think one of the, the most obvious uh, places that we can start to uh, uh, supply uh, housing for people that require it in this city are with uh, secondary suites. And secondary suites within, within the city provide a number of options for not only the people that require them, and the people that are uh, really in a situation where they need housing. They also provide options for the homeowner owners themselves. This is uh, something that homeowner homeowners can actually bring forward as, as part of their rights as homeowners. I'd like to see um, Calgarians express their own passions for this city as well and their compassions for this city by actually providing housing of this type of, uh, of this sort within, within the city. A secondary suite allows not only that, uh, that person that requires the housing to enjoy the housing, but it sets uh, people up to be able to, a senior for example, to be able to have a student that's in their home uh, that will help them not only uh, pay what they need to pay in a declining income. It'll also help them even have somebody mow their lawns and take care and actually allow people to age in place and, and stay within the community. Um, so while we're providing housing, we can also provide options that homeowners can exercise within the city and it can also allow them to, uh, to uh, stay and in their communities Young families can come in and have somebody assist in actually paying for a mortgage and help their families move forward within the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. Um, now, Mr. Dohan, I'd like to invite you for your answer. All right. Uh, regarding secondary suites, I see this as a perfect opportunity to engage the citizens of War II through a secure online voting system of some sort, I could put the question out to you. What do you think? Do we need to have these secondary suites in our ward? I ultimately listen to you, and I would act on your behalf. My personal opinion is uh, after door knocking, 13,500 doors, I see many illegal suites out there. You walk to the door, there's two, three doorbells, they're out there, folks. Personally, 
I'm for legalizing secondary suites if there's a proper fire assessment done by a fire inspector and as well a traffic assessment for each individual street. That's all I have to say about secondary suites. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dohan. So before we continue, I'd just like to interrupt. I believe one of you gentlemen might have misplaced my papers. I'm missing some paper. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> That's minus one minute off the clock for you. <laughs> All right, so would anyone else like to chime in with their poker chips? Go ahead, Mr. Wong. Sure. <laughs> housing is a fundamental requirement of all citizens of Calgary. Housing is a fundamental requirement of all of our children and of all of our seniors. These are the people that we need to protect the most. Housing is one of those things that we need to acquire whether we purchase it or we rent it, or whether it's one of those things that we are able to, uh, you know, if I can use the term, squat in, squat in the, the families, uh, families' homes and that. But one of the things that housing has become in Calgary here is unaffordable. And one of the things we need to take a look at is the ways in which we can make housing affordable again, not just housing that is, is uh, uh, low condition or, or low quality, but safe and responsible housing. So secondary suites is definitely a way to approach it, but it's also a way to approach it in a manner that's acceptable to communities, acceptable to neighbors, and acceptable to you know, the citizens in Calgary in general. So again, I would support secondary housing but with conditions. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. I do uh, support uh, suites also, but it has to be owner occupied. Um, and also, I support them legalizing suites that make sense to the new communities, the potential homeowners, know that the community is zoned such uh, for suites. And uh, it makes sense for legalizing suites near universities, Mount Royal, and uh, around the state area. It makes total sense for me, but it has to be owner occupied. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maglioka. So the next um, question will be directed to Mr. Wong and Mr. Maglioka. So do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city? If you believe it is a problem, what will you do to address it and or what have you done? Mr. Wong? I apologize for a minute. I do have a hearing impediment. Mm -hmm. Let me just see the question if you don't mind. Um, is it okay if I read it out again? Yeah, let me just turn to, to here if you like. Okay, no problem. So, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city? And if you believe it is a problem, what will you do to address it and or what have you done? One of the things that Calgary is challenged with is the development of, of housing, as we referred to earlier. Affordable housing, accessible housing, housing that is available to all, uh, all residents from, uh, regardless of income. In doing so, we've talked about providing housing both in the urban sprawl areas as well as in the inner city areas. At the end of the day, whatever we want to do, we need to be able to provide housing that is affordable. The city of Calgary has a responsibility to develop land, to provide lands to, land supply to the, uh, to the developers in which we do that. The city of Calgary also has a responsibility to maintain the existing lands and the existing infrastructure in our established communities. In doing so, we need to find the right balance in achieving that. From an infrastructure asset management perspective, we can't afford to build everywhere across the city. However, at the same time, from a consumer perspective, we can't afford not to give them a choice as to where to build. So we need to have responsible leadership, mature leadership, leadership that understands the balance of existing versus new, the cost of uh, maintaining what we have today versus the cost of building. At the end of the day, when we talk about urban sprawl, it's not urban sprawl, it's about having complete, complete communities. Making sure the communities we put out there are well managed, well sequenced, well prioritized, and most importantly, affordable to, to uh, all the, all the uh, consumers that are out there. The City of Calgary has a very established program through a growth management framework. It has a very uh, um, rich uh, vision through our, our um, Planet Calgary Municipal Development Plan on all the variety of uh, our plans that are out there. What we need to do is work in communicating those plans with the developers, with the consumers, with the, the people who want to be a part of that equation, and making sure at the end of the day that those plans that might have been developed 5, 10, 15 years ago 
are properly representative not only today but representative the, the, uh, the needs of tomorrow. My leadership will be bringing forward that dialogue to update and adjust the growth management framework. Thank you, Mr. Wong. And Mr. Magliocca. I, uh, I don't believe uh, that the spawn is a big issue, to be quite frank with you. I, uh, I, I think density does come with a cost, too. Uh, in the downtown core, it comes with a huger cost in the building because it pays for itself in the, uh, in the, in the uh, new areas. Uh, they say an average home would cost the Calgarians about $4,400. Uh, we got facts here that does not cost about uh, $2,500 per home, and that is paid for within the first year of occupancy, and from then on the, the uh, city starts to make money. And density comes with a cost. You put up a tower about 30, 40 stories. You got to build all their sewer systems and water mains differently for miles and miles from that condo. So density does come with a cost. And suburbs versus density, downtown, you can get a 600 square foot condo for four or $500,000 where you can live in the suburbs for 250 to 300,000 with a 16, 1700 square foot home. It's great for young families. They got their backyards. They got uh, uh, they got play play zones, and they have parks to play in. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You know what? It all comes down to choice. I'd be a hypocrite if I said, you know what? I'm against urban sprawl because you know what? I live out here in the suburbs. I understand that people want their piece of grass. I also understand that people want to live closer to downtown, to the amenities that downtown offers. I get that. You need to have a balance between growth out in the suburbs and densification downtown. You know what? I'd make it easier for everyone. I'm not backed by any big developers. I don't have connections down at City Hall. I get that. But you know what? I would listen to both sides of the story both sides of the issue, and then make my decision from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dohan. Would anyone else like to hear? Go ahead, Mr. Ripley. Thank you. I don't think it's a matter of being for or against urban sprawl per se. I think really it's a, it's a question of growing our city intelligently, really taking a, a hard and fast look at what we're providing to people that are actually moving into communities. Are we just providing family dormitories where people just sleep, eat, or are we providing complete communities? To me, that's more where this question really lies. Um, I can tell you that for me, the focus in my business life has actually been to build complete communities that are intelligent and that actually provide a lifestyle for people that's really what we need to be concerned with. Is it about density? Is it the urban environment versus suburban? It's none of these things. It's about intelligent growth, proper management of our resources. And I see I'm against my time. I would have much more to say on this issue, but I will respectfully uh, with the time. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. <laughs> All right, that brings us to our next set of questions. And this is directed to Mr. Dohan and Mr. Maglioka. So the question is, how do you think we can create greater mobility choices in the city and in your ward? Mr. Dohan? Greater mobility choices. How do you think we can create greater mobility choices in the city and in your ward? Uh, great question. In regards to mobility choices, I'm one of the candidates here who takes transit regularly, so I know you know, the shortcomings of it, the successes of it, what annoys me, what I like about it. Everybody needs to have choices in life in terms of how you get to work, how you play, how you make things work for yourself. In terms of creating more choices, why not with the new transit line, have a bike path right beside it? In regards to bike paths in this community and uh, mobility choices, we have bike paths that end at chain link fences. You guys aware of that? <laughs> Royal Vista? Okay. Yeah, they have a nice bike path system and all of a sudden it just stops at a chain link fence. So we need to make sure that people, as Mr. Ripley mentioned, when they live in their community, they have a place to actually enjoy their community. 
So we need to make sure that these mobility choices work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dahat. I, I agree uh, with uh, Bernie. And uh, we need better access and roads. We need to start really thinking outside of the box how we're going to get people from point A to point B. I uh, had a discussion uh, a couple of days ago with the ex CEO of um, CP Rail. And I just put it out there to him, so what your thoughts are on this idea that I have? And he said, Joe, it's a great idea. My thought is what it is, is using the CN rail um, train tracks that are available right now down to Deerfoot and putting double deck buses, the bu double deck trains that you can pick up from Airdrie and go all the way down to Okotoks and use the uh, Park Gate and 9th and um, 5th there to make it a central station where people could be dropped off and then take the light train in and out of the downtown core. And he said it's valuable, they can work together with it. And uh, one of the ideas came up a bunch of years ago and they looked at it. And it's still viable and we can still manage to do that. And I think we, we got to stop reinventing the wheel and we can move a lot of people that way. Thank you. Thank you. And would anyone else like to use their poker chips at all? No? All right, that brings us to our next question, uh, which is for Mr. Wong and Mr. Ripley. And the question is, what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, and how would your efforts improve that initiative? Mr. Wong? Sure. One of the things we often look at from a, a poverty perspective is, a, uh, is the income side of the equation. We often look at the capacity of individuals to uh, seek employment, to be able to find a, employment where the income is sufficient to provide what they need. The City of Calgary itself is not in the business of defining income. Mm -hmm. What the City of Calgary can do, though, is define the cost of living. Mm -hmm. From a cost of living perspective, we need to provide services, whether it be transit, whether it be recreation, whether it be the access to, you know, to programs uh, for, for, uh, for children after school programs, whatever the case may be. We need to be able to provide it in a manner that's affordable. So whatever income a person has, there's a greater degree of discretionary income that they can therefore then use to, to support the families and the, the lifestyle they choose to have. The City of Calgary has capacities of doing that. The question is, does the society and, and the, the citizens of Calgary uh, uh, support that notion? I believe we do. I believe we, you know, we are a caring, and commu a caring community, a caring community that recognizes the, the future values of our children, as well as, as, well as uh, recognizes the value and rewards that our seniors provide to us. In doing that, I guess what I'm trying to uh, say is that you know, the poverty situation in Calgary is one that we can influence by making life much more affordable for, for, our, uh, for our citizens. Affordable both, again, in terms of their programs and services, but more importantly, affordable in the capital costs of uh, purchasing houses or purchasing uh, the, the, um, how do you say, the, uh, the typical assets that, that most people would uh, enjoy in their households. Thank you, Mr. Wong. And Mr. Ripley. Thank you. Great question. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems facing our city, certainly. I think the city of Calgary is in a fantastic position to actually show incredible leadership in this regard. One of the things that uh, often doesn't get talked about is actually a living wage. What is the poverty line? How do we actually uh, have people achieve at least that level of existence and that level of, uh, of income? The City of Calgary certainly is not in a position to actually enforce businesses to provide such a living wage. In other words, have their employees actually meet that level of, we're just talking about just meeting poverty here. But the City of Calgary is in the position to set an example by providing that level within its own organization. It could and it should, and I would argue that it must do this and provide that level of leadership within the city. It's very important for the city to exemplify what can be done and to go ahead and actually do it. The other aspect of this is certainly uh, with regards to homelessness. We're five years into a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Have we reduced it? We certainly have stopped the increase but we haven't yet made it anywhere near where we need to be for actually ending homelessness. We have another five years of this plan. I'd like to be able to um, 
ensure that council at least understands what this plan is and take it forward and actually execute it and try and achieve these goals within our city. These are very, very important issues for us. And the city of Calgary needs and must show that leadership. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ripley. Would anyone like to use their poker chips? <laughs> Choosing wisely. So this brings us to our last round of questions, and this is directed to Mr. Maglioka and Mr. Ripley, and it is chosen at random. I'm not picking on you, Mr. Ripley. <laughs> so the question is, how will you ensure all Calgarians have access to the recreational and sports facilities they need for their ongoing health and well-being? Mr. Maglioka? Well, I'm a big uh, believer in rec centers and uh, for kids growing up around rec centers too and keeping them occupied and keeping them out of shopping centers. Uh, what I'd like to do is start introducing a lot more P3 programs. I think that's the way we should go uh, and let the uh, major uh, developer or the, uh, the uh, sponsorship of the uh, rec center get involved and let them put up all the cost and get them earn their, uh, earn their uh, dollar back, their investment, and then turn it over to the city. That's uh, what I would uh, do, and I really do need, uh, we do need a uh, rec center out here in the Northwest, and we're working really hard on getting that. It's been neglected for a bunch of years due to funding, but I do believe a P3 program will work extremely well out here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ripley? Thank you. Yeah, certainly, recreational centers are part of the fabric of uh, what we need to have as a society. It's um, part of moving beyond providing that family dormitory style of living where people just live and eat in a place. It's where they can actually uh, enjoy time with their family, make sure that their health and well-being is being taken care of. So we're in an incredible deficit in many parts of the city, including, of course, our own ward. I'm uh, certainly um, encouraged by what I see happening with the, uh, with the uh, Northwest Recreation Center at this point. P3s are certainly a really good way to approach uh, this type of center, and that's more of a mechanism of actually bringing this forward and actually providing that type of service. What we also need to focus on is the programming and the accessibility of the programming for individuals at the recreational centers. What type of accessibility does it have uh, for people to come in and actually enjoy those programs? Um, what, type of, uh, what type of integration does it have within the community itself? Is it a standalone facility? Um, or do we have programs that actually reach out into the community and encourage health, wellness, vitality, and how people actually enjoy and, and appreciate a quality of life within the city? The city's role is certainly to ensure that this type of, uh, type of facility moves forward. Um, and I know from the development community and my involvement directly as a, as a part of the development community and other places, developers are interested in helping this happen. So there are solutions to this issue. Again, I'm against the time and I respectfully will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. <laughs> Mr. Dohan. Uh, Rocky, Red, Rocky Ridge Recreation Center needs to get built on time and on budget. First proposed 2007, it's now 2013. There's still not a shovel in the ground. A couple months ago it said it was going to be open in 2016. New release, it's coming out now in 2017. The people of this quadrant of the city deserve this facility. P3s, it's a reason it's being delayed. The federal government didn't come through with the funding for this in regards to P3s. This Rocky Ridge Recreation Center, it's going to offer community engagement opportunities for all citizens, young and older. Our current alderman, Gord Lowe, must be congratulated for getting the necessary funding in place. However, he hasn't lived here for the last five years, and he hasn't pushed to get it built. Remember that when you vote, who lives here and is going to push to get it built on time. Thank you, Mr. Dahan. Mr. Wong? Why do we have recreation? Recreation is 
to provide quality of life for our citizens, quality of life for our seniors, quality of life for our youth, quality of life for all of us. It's not all, all about you know going to work every day and coming home and, and uh, you know enjoying you know family inside the house. It's also about enjoying family outside of the house. One of the things I grew up in, I grew up with is parks where we didn't just walk through a park from one end to the other. We actually walked into a park and played and stayed and played. And one of the things that we talk about the Northwest Rec Center, and I, I don't disagree, we need the Northwest Rec Center, but it's a, it's a consideration that's going to take a lot longer to solve, you know, whether it be uh, working with the federal government, working with developers and that. But there are things that we could do now to provide for recreation for our citizens and for our children. And that is putting more neighborhood facilities, uh, um, you know, equipment in, in the parks so that kids can actually enjoy it now. And with the monies that we've got in the, in the city's reserves, with the monies that we've got through our, if I can use the term, property tax space, there are options that we can do now to take care of recreation today. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Your time is up, I'm sorry. So the last question is directed to Mr. Wong and Mr. Dohan. And that question is, with the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? Mr. Dohan? Sure, Mr. Wong, go ahead. That's okay. One of the things that uh, I think, again, growing up, growing up in, uh, you know, how to say, the 60s and 70s in a, in a city where we did allow agricultural growth in uh, residential homes. We did allow having, you know, we use animals as part of our food, uh, uh, food stock in our homes. And this is not in, a, in a, a country outside of Canada. This is a, in a city within Canada. We, we had environments where, yes, you wanted to raise a chicken, you can have a chicken. You wanted to have a little pig in your backyard, you could have a little pig in your backyard. Okay? If you wanted to raise you know, corn in, in your backyard, you could do that as well. The fundamental is this. We need to give our citizens the right to choose how they provide for their families. Providing food is certainly one of those options. And in doing so, I don't think the city should be telling us what we can and can't do doing. However, at the same time, I do believe that we should do it in a responsible manner within our communities and within our neighborhoods. Speaking about raising chickens and specifically, and, and the question of uh, urban, urban chicken farming, I will again challenge people to sit and ask yourself the question, is it, is it really about you know, raising uh, chickens and eggs for yourself, or is it really about an animal bylaw consideration about being responsible and having, you know, having animals in your backyard? I'd like to separate the issue. The issue of raising, you know, growing your own food, having sustainable food stock for your house is separate from the issue of animal bylaw control as to, as to whether or not you're doing it in a responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Dohan. Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. With the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? Good. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting dilemma, and I'm going to take the attitude of a NIMBY on this one. Uh, community gardens, yes, I will work with community associations to get them built, to have them in neighborhoods, but in terms of urban agriculture, chickens in backyard, if I'm understanding the issue correctly, I do not support that. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond? Mr. Ripley? Thank you. Urban agriculture, um, I think, provides more than just the opportunity to uh, increase food security within our own communities. It provides uh, another way for community to actually interact. Community gardens, specifically, is what I'm focusing on here not necessarily livestock per se, but certainly urban agriculture itself, where we have community gardens. People get out, they work together, they grow food together, they, they cultivate together, they celebrate together. It's a harvest, it's part of who we are. Um, and there, there is that, uh, that uh, community aspect that, that comes forward. Um, do we expect to see more? from government initiatives, only if we get out there and actually do it, and, and the city itself actually encourages it, and for the right reasons. Food security and building community. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, everyone, that concludes the first half of the evening. We're about halfway through, so we can take a short 15-minute break. I just want to remind everyone that um, the questions that I have asked thus far were the most voted on our website. And um, also another reminder, just um, during the break, you can take, uh, help yourself, sorry, to the back there and enter any questions that you would like to ask our candidates. And um, that is all. Um, thank you for the candidates for now. Be back in 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Welcome back to the Civic Camp Citizens Ward 2 Councillor Forum. Um, before we get to the questions, you have submitted your own round of questions as well as people who submitted online. So we will take this time now to ask uh, ward specific questions and um, it will work the same way. So this is the first um, ward specific question is for Mr. Sorry, Mr. Ripley and Mr. Maglioka. So what is your position on current taxation and what would you do differently? Mr. Maglioka? Well, the uh, $52 million, first thing I would have done is give it back to the people. That's where it deserves a of surplus. <laughs> people are thinking it's a surplus. It is definitely not a surplus. That's your hard earned tax dollars. What I would have done, it's not what we did with Ralph Bucks, is I would have taken that portion of the $52 million and put it directly into your dwelling. So let's say if your tax was $2,000, it would be like $2,800 for the next five years. And that's where I would then, it's hard earned money goes back to the hard earned people. We've got to stop treating people like ATM machines. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ripley. Thank you. I think we all understand that uh, we have to pay property taxes. We have to provide services to our citizens, and we have to provide value through those services as well. People expect value. They expect that they're going to get something for uh, what they're paying into the system. We can't just say that we're going to lower taxes. You know, uh, we have some candidates that will say, we're going to get rid of taxes, but where does that happen? Or we're going to lower taxes. Where does that happen? In some magical, mystical place. We've had at least 30 years of candidates coming up and saying, we will lower taxes, we will eliminate taxes, we will get the taxes lower. It never happens. We can't actually get there. Citizens expect services and they expect value and it's about intelligently providing those services to the citizens. It's about finding out exactly what, what services citizens need, how can we provide them efficiently, and how can we bring that value. In business, we would have to provide value in order to get a customer, in order to grow. We also need to take that value as it's realized and reinvest it back into our companies in order to break, in order to grow them and to be able to create jobs. In the city, it's the same thing. We have to be able to reinvest in our city. We're just talking about smart growth and providing complete communities, providing places where people can enjoy and live. We have to be able to invest in those services. Do we have to do it smartly? Absolutely. We have to take an intelligent approach. We can't just say as candidates, we're going to reduce taxes. It simply doesn't happen without taking an intelligent approach first and providing value. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. And Mr. Dohan? Uh, Mr. Wongo, he had it in first. Oh, good eye. Mr. Wong? Thank you. Sean, Sean put it very uh, eloquently. Your taxes are designed to provide you the value you require to live in, and live in and prosper in the city here. The taxes that you are uh, paying are directed to provide the services, the programs, the assets that you enjoy in the city here. If we don't invest in the city of Calgary, we will end up, end up in a city much the same as a lot of the North American U.S. type cities that we are, are going to, uh, I say, uh, experience in today. Value is the most important thing. Now, the fundamental question you ask is, what do we do with the taxes this year? What do we do with the taxes next year? What I'm going to propose is basically to say that we need to take a look at the current taxes we have now and make sure that they're allocated in the right areas to provide the priority services you want 
and to provide the value that you need. Once you do that, the second question you ask is, what are the priority that the city needs and wants the citizens? And then and only then do you raise taxes. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Doyan? Folks, I'm going to ask you to hold me accountable. If I'm elected, I will never vote for a property tax increase of more than 5%. Is this an arbitrary number? No. It's a cost of living plus a bit more to deal with the current infrastructure deficit that we have. I would never vote for a property tax increase of more than 5%. I've been accused by some people on Twitter of being a tax and spend liberal. Does that sound like a tax and spend liberal to you? No. So that's my position on property tax increases, nothing above 5%. Thank you. Mr. Doham. So I will invite uh, Mr. Dohan and Mr. Wong for the next question. What are the candidates' position on the closure of McCall Lake Golf Course? Mr. Wong? What is your position on the closure of McCall Lake Golf Course? McCall Lake Golf Course is one of the types of golf courses or recreation facilities that are provided to all citizens. Whether you're a, a child or whether you're a senior, it's a place of recreation, a place of enjoyment. We only have two 18-hole golf courses in the city here, McCall Lake and uh, Maple Ridge. Taking away, taking away a golf course like that denies a lot of our citizens the, the access to that type of recreation. I'm a fundamental believer that we can find ways of making McCall Golf Course work effectively, efficiently, and economically. The question is, again, from, from the city's perspective, have we found ways to maximize the use of the golf courses? Golf courses in Calgary are, are often, um, I'd say, five months at best utilized. I have ways of actually making golf courses 12 months viable. Though the thing, the question we ask is, what do you do with the other seven months? Can we turn it into a cross-country ski track? Can we tur turn it into a place where people can go out and do uh, uh, winter recreation? Can we turn the ponds into the ice rinks? These are things that do not cost money, but these are things that recreation-wise we can utilize. If we take away these golf courses, we don't have recreation places, accessible, affordable recreation places for our citizens. So we'll call golf course. If you want to take it away, turn it into uh, rich industrial commercial lands, fine, do so, but let's find a replacement. We can't just take away something and not put something back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Um, just to keep watch of the time, I just want to invite everyone to hold their applause to the end, please. Sorry, thank you. Mr. Dohan? Well, Mr. Wong took my exact speech on the Call Lake Golf Course. Um, I want my chip back. Um, in regards to McCall Lake Golf Course, you know what, I'm raising a young family. I got a young boy who loves the sport of golf. There's not too many places, golf courses in the city of Calgary where I can take him golfing and not spend more than $150, $200 in a day. We need to keep city properties like this for our future generations, for the retired people in here who have that opportunity to utilize it every day. And uh, as Mr. Wong explained, yes, we need to utilize it in those other seven months. Cross-country ski trails. He forgot a toboggan hill. We've got to get a toboggan hill out there. <laughs> got to have a good drive like I do. Anyways, um, you know what? Cross-country ski trails, let's do it. It makes sense. From a personal perspective, I uh, played rugby across the street on 32nd Ave with the Calgary Saints. Our field got pushed out for development. So from a personal perspective, I know what it's like. Now, where do we practice? We practice along Crowchild. It's not the same, okay? Recreation facilities like McCall Lake Golf Course, we need to keep, and I will do it, and make it a 12-month recreation spot. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond? No, thank you. Okay, so the last question here is for, sorry, Mr. Wong and Mr. Ripley. 
So where or how would you focus your efforts in your first year in office? Mr. Maglioka? Oh, sorry, Mr. Ripley. I would focus my efforts on smart growth and achieving smart growth within Calgary. Smart growth is such an important issue for us. We've heard uh, discussions around urban sprawl. We've had some responses say that urban sprawl is not an issue. Some say that there's a, uh, a divide between urban and suburban, and that type of a setting uh, uh, that we're moving forward with. But actually taking a real intelligent look at what we can achieve through smart growth in this city we can actually achieve the things that we're trying to do as a city. We can uh, have a quality of life that we're trying to achieve. We can, we can uh, have families that actually are able to enjoy their communities. There's a bridge that can happen between the development community and City Hall. I have that experience. I'm likely the only candidate at this table that has that experience, the vision for smart growth and experience in actually developing uh, and bringing forward smart growth within, within uh, actual developments and within City Hall itself, and also that, that vision that brings it forward. Um, I can bridge between the development community and City Hall. So that's where I would focus. I bring that experience forward on behalf of the board and focus on <laughs> smart growth an intelligent design and moving the city forward in that intelligent aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maglioka? Oh, sorry, Mr. Maglioka? Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. <laughs> as many of you know, I've been with the city for the last 29 years. The things that Sean's referring to are important things to do, no doubt. The priority of, of uh, the Pope for Terry Wong campaign is very much around growth. But my first priority is really to remove a lot of the roadblocks that are preventing the city from moving forward. When you talk about development in the Northwest, we've got a, a, a sanitary sewer problem. We've got to move that, clear the roadblock, so that we can have, again, the, uh, the development that's done in the area. The, we talk about uh, densification and that, again, we need to have the transforming and planning exercise of the city of Calgary move fast and forward so that developers, builders can get in there and start doing what they need to do. However, my first priority when I get in there is to stop having the tail wag the dog. And I, this, this, is a, this is a message, a harsh message. As a person from administration, I often say, why is it that we try to force the ways we do things on the citizens? Why is it we not listen to the citizens? In the last four months of Delanoff, from what I've begun to realize is that our method, our view, of our citizens need to be broadened, need to be open, need to be widened to understand what citizens want, not what we want to give the citizens. So my first, uh, my first exercise with the council, with the administration, is to have a refocusing of how we deal with our citizens, how we listen, how we engage, and how we respect their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Dohan. Anyone here from Evanston? No? Well, I guess I'm not going to get their vote, but hopefully they'll hear about this. Folks, I don't live in Evanston, but there's 8,500 people who live there. There's only one entrance into that community. Um, people are talking about using a pilot project of pylons for a solution. You know what? Permanent solutions are better for the people of Evanston. Within one year of getting elected, I would get another road open for the people of Evanston. This not, might not get me votes for the people of Arbor Lake and Royal Oak and everywhere else, but you know what? It makes sense. What if there was ever a natural, an emergency? Let's say a grass fire, natural gas leak. You're telling me you are going to evacuate 8,500 people out of one entrance? No way. People of Evanston need another road. <laughs> Mr. Magalioka? Uh, for the people that live in Royal Oak, and I'd like to give you two 
what's the first thing to council is to reopen that exit onto Crow Child and have a flyover for north and southbound to make it a lot easier entrance in and out of Royal Oak. Thank you. Thank you. So that was actually going to be my next question about Evanston. So you guys have addressed that already. So I'll move on to the next question. And the next. I don't know. Do they want to? They seem a little shy. No? We're good. Yes, just the Evanston, the one exit out, in and out, if you'd like to respond. Sure. Um, <laughs> one minute on the clock, please. Permanent solutions are certainly uh, absolutely where we need to go. No question. Achieving a permanent solution for Evanston, I think, is, is a given. Um, the province has already ramps in place for the 14th Street connecting into Stony Trail. There's a couple other options that are there. There's trigger points for development of those permanent solutions. What do we do in the meantime? We focus on the permanent solutions, certainly. But we've put forward an idea here that we can use right away. It's a simple solution. It's straightforward. Yes, it's a pilot project. This is how we find out if these things actually work. And as we're doing it, we now have three lanes coming out of it and instead of two in the morning. We have three lanes going back in in the afternoon. We're moving people in and out. It's about mobility and actually achieving a solution. We're not even on council yet and we're putting forward a solution like this. This is a type of solution that I would put forward onto council and we would see results happening on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. And so the next question um, from the audience is directed to Mr. Magliocca and Mr. Dohan. What, are your, what is your position on campaign transparency? Mr. Magliocca? Why is that addressed to me? I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to follow the law when I can, my donor's list is going to be available. And uh, the transparency is very important to people. If that's what they want, that's what they're going to get. I am going to put my uh, donor's list is coming out as we speak. In the next few days, we'll put it together. We just been concentrating on the campaign. Uh, it, it's for somebody who gives a hundred dollars to a candidate, and they have to have their name smeared all over the internet. I, I think that's pointless. I don't think that should be done. I can understand five thousand, two thousand, and above, but a hundred dollars. A single mother gives a hundred dollars to a candidate, and your name has to be smeared all over the internet. Is wrong. I'd like to uh, change that. Uh, to be $2,000 Thank you. Mr. Dohan? My list of donors has been made public on my website for the last six months. Sure, it's not impressive as some of the others, but guess what? I'm proud of that. I'm proud I'm getting donations from my friends, families. The last week, I'm getting random donations from people emailing me, telling me what they like www.berniedohan.ca slash transparency, you can find it there. Looking at ward2.ca, it says, it's no secret how a candidate operates their campaign is exactly how they will serve their constituents. I believe that open dialogue is critical and asking questions is key. Well, we all know whose website that is, so make them public. I challenge. Make them public tomorrow. It's not that difficult. You got a spreadsheet, put it out on your website. Let us know who is funding each and every one's campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond? Mr. Ripley? Transparency is of the utmost importance. The reason I say that is because it's the citizenry that's asking for it. The people want to know, why would we not provide them with exactly what they're asking for? We want to be elected into council and we're going to take the position that we don't respond to the citizens' requests and to the very things that are fundamental to the citizenry of this city. How can that possibly uh, uh, jive with what we're trying to achieve on council? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Our donors list has been uh, put forward from uh, day after nomination day. It has been 
updated on a regular basis. There will be another update tomorrow. It continues to be updated. And you'll see that there's donations from builders. You'll see that there's donations from friends. There's donations from strangers in the community that believe in my vision of, of Calgary. But, to be clear, I have a passion for this city, and nobody that uh, donates to my campaign... Thank you, Mr. Ripley. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, thank you. Anyone else? You okay? Mr. Wong? If you, first of all, I'll go back to my website, uh, votefrontierlawn.com. You'll find a, a pledge uh, statement in there as to my um, contributions. And it is out there, and, and you can go there and look at it tonight. But the most important thing I think of talking about transparency is not just what you contribute, or excuse me, people contribute to you and what you declare, but it's also how you carry yourself out in the public, how you carry yourself out in, in, in your daily, daily activities and, and, uh, and uh, engagements with citizens. I think that if whatever you do today sets a hallmark as to how you can perform over the next four years, and that is probably the most important thing I'd like to see in, in, uh, in any candidate. Again, be open, be honest, be genuine, be truthful. Say it now, say it later. People will love you. Thank you. Thank you. So the last audience question is directed to Mr. Ripley and Mr. Wong. The question is, with the vast majority of Calgary's arts and culture institutions found downtown, how can we get more arts to suburban areas? Mr. Ripley? Bringing the arts into the suburban communities. I think, I think first of all, you have to understand that arts is a visceral experience, and that uh, people that are involved in providing arts and culture in the city um, live everywhere. How do we actually get people uh, within the community? of the work to, to actually be able to participate in the arts is, is, is a great question. I think it's around programming and around uh, making sure that we're uh, providing experiences for people in, in all types of situations. I've seen some solutions in some other, other areas that I think have worked really well that are mobile, um, uh, mobile uh, arts exhibits are actually able to bring things up out of the core and actually bring them out into the communities for people to experience. And of course, keeping in mind when we talk about arts, we, we, we tend to think of it in, in, in one way. Arts is a very, very diverse sort of aspect that we experience in this city. Music, a venue right here, for example, we could bring in all types of performers into the venue like this. I've worked with a, a number of churches that are trying to actually uh, expand their reach into the, into the community in terms of providing venues for arts. So we could certainly bring, bring artists into the community into venues like this. Um, programming for children. Making sure that our children are actually able to participate in the summer programs, for example, and actually learn and, and, and display what they're, what they're doing in terms of art. It's a fantastic way to get that into the community and reach it out into the, into the suburban environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. Mr. Wong? When we talk about arts and culture, when we talk about arts, not only the things that we draw or things we play in, in musical instruments, we talk about arts from the perspective of how we enjoy our society and enjoy our lives. Arts often comes from not just the individual itself, arts comes from culture, comes from nationalities, comes from religion. One of the things we need to do is have that spread across Calgary. A lot of it currently is residing in the center, central part of Calgary today. What the city can do to spread it out is first and foremost provide infrastructure so that this arts and culture can be spread across the city. The Northwest Rec Center, the Rocky Ridge Rec Center coming up is one of the primary opportunities, one of the prime examples right now where we can actually build, because we haven't put the shovel in the ground yet, Build you know, studio space, performance space, spaces for theaters, for, so that again, rather than having to go downtown to Jackson or going all the way down to Quarry Park to the Cardell, Cardell place, we can actually do that here. So first and foremost, the city county should be looking at investing in studio space, performance space, and space for, for uh, arts and culture. The other thing that we also need to be able to do is to recognize that arts and culture doesn't start in one area and stay in one area. Arts and culture actually starts in 
all parts of the city and spreads around. One of the things I take a look at in the last June, uh, June uh, 2013 flood, we lost a lot of arts and culture in Chinatown. We lost a lot of it due to floods in basements. We lost a lot of it in terms of artifacts. We lost a lot of it in our libraries. Bernie certainly knows that. One of the things we need to do is just invest in protecting the stuff that we have now and sharing it across Calgary, sharing it across the different regions of Calgary. So we take the Chinatown example as, as an example. We need to take Chinatown's cultural center and spread that to the north, spread it to the east. But we need to do that through Helen spoke of central, central support and distributed uh, uh, infrastructure so that we can all enjoy it, not just for Chinatown, for all cultures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Would anyone else like to respond? No. Uh-oh. <laughs> So that ends the round of audience questions. We'll now move on to our last round of crowdsourced questions. And the first question of this round goes to Mr. Dohan and Mr. Maglioka. So the question is, would you support a policy that gives siblings first priority in schools that must use a lottery for admittance? Why or why not? Mr. Dohan? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if this is the forum for that question. That sounds like a school board question in regards to that. I think it exceeds what we do at a municipal level. Mm -hmm. um, never really thought about it before. Uh, schools are a contentious issue in uh, this area in terms of not having them when communities are built. Uh, in terms of the lottery, sure, I'm for it. Thank you, nonetheless, thank you. Mr. Maglioka? Uh, I don't know much about the issue myself either, but the, like Bray said, with the lottery, I'm forward to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And would anyone else like to respond? So the last question then is for Mr. Ripley and Mr. Wong. Do you support a City of Calgary living wage policy? Mr. Ripley? Yes, sir. I believe I touched on this issue earlier in the discussion around uh, uh, the fabric of society in Calgary. Uh, as I mentioned then, the city of Calgary is not in a position to actually enforce a living wage uh, on businesses. Uh, however, it is in a position to take a leadership role in providing a living wage uh, within its own organization. And I think it, it can and it should do this. You got to keep in mind here, let's, let's be clear on what we're talking about. The living wage is just simply achieving poverty line. Poverty line, folks. This is not anything that we're reaching into, into some extravagances. This is just poverty line. The city of Calgary is in a position to, to uh, set that example and leadership within the community. Um, I would like to see that example move forward as soon as possible and working with uh, in conjunction with the living wage is moving forward the, the, the plan for homelessness ending homelessness and uh, you know five years into that plan as I mentioned before we're making headway we're stopping the increase of it but we're not anywhere near where we need to be and uh, that is, is something that is completely in conjunction with the living wage issue. So, um, yes, I would certainly support um, seeing that leadership come from the city of Calgary itself so that we could see uh, businesses take a look at how that actually can work and hopefully they will implement it within their own organizations. And that is something we can and must do. Thank you. Mr. Wong? Sean, again, we, we dealt with this earlier, but I'm going to express it in a different sort of way as well. The City of Calgary has over 20,000 employees in there. The City of Calgary has professionals. We have people who are, um, would be, who are fleet, uh, fleet operations, bus drivers. We have people who are planners, engineers. We have people in many different classes of professions. The City of Calgary can establish a standard of hallmark across the industry as to what a living wage should be. However, the city county could also, must also be responsible in defining what that salary looks like. 
and in, 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 again, going back to my career at the city, I spent a lot of time with our HR department. I spent a lot of time with their collective bargaining units. I spent a lot of time understanding what that cost is. One of the things that we need to do is have our labor rates at the city county revisited to ensure that it matches the marketplace and it also reflects that living wage that people want to see. Not just at the city county, but competitively in the marketplace. The second part of the equation, which we almost spoke about earlier, is the cost of living. The city economy has ways of ensuring the cost of living is affordable, so that again, we take a look at the, the uh, living wage side of the equation, there's more disposable income. We can do that through a variety of different revenue, revenue approaches, uh, fees for services, uh, transit fare approaches, to again, bring the cost to be much more affordable to citizens, and thereby create a greater capacity for them to have disposable income to do the things that you know we don't do, such as providing a target, a target uh, um, uh, department store or a superstore. We don't provide those things, but what we should do is provide affordability, income capacity, so you can actually go spend your money wisely. Thank you. Thank you. So I do apologize for my school-related question. To make it fair, I'll ask you a more generalized question for Mr. Dohan and Mr. Maglioka. So the question is, um, Calgary is the only Canadian city of its size with no municipal grants for artists. What role should the city play in investing in its artists? Mr. Dohan? Great question. Um, the city needs to play somewhat of a role in terms of providing grants for artists but we also have to remain fiscally disciplined. We can't break the bank for the arts. Listen, I support the arts, I go to the CPO, my children, my wife, they're in Ukrainian dancing, I get the arts. They're a viable part of making Calgary the city of what it is today. If we can uh, maybe work together with the other three levels of government in finding a solution to give grants to artists, I would be in support of. However, I would not break the bank for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Magliocca. I would uh, do scholarships and all that for art, and how I would fund that is not breaking the bank. I would just stop putting fishes on bridges in Glenmore and all over the place, remove that for $4 million, and start giving that as grants to artists here in Calgary. Thank you. Anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So that concludes um, the crowdsource and audience questions for the evening. We will now have a quick round of questions, and um, sometimes it is difficult providing specifics in a small brochure or on a website for um, during your campaign. That's not too wordy. So this is your chance to provide details, and this round is called the How Round. So uh, we previously visited your website and um, your materials and read through your materials, and each candidate will be given 30 seconds in this round to tell us exactly how they plan to accomplish um, the specific goal. So please be specific as possible and avoid giving any background as to why this goal is important. This is time for details. So I will do it in the um, opposite order that we did the introductions in. So the first um, how to question will go to Mr. Ripley. So coming from a business background, one of your main visions is controlling city costs. So how do you plan on seeing this vision through? It's about smart spending and taking uh, an approach to growing the city in an intelligent manner. It's very easy to actually take this uh, approach. Um, smart growth within the city, as I've mentioned a few times this evening, is about taking a look at building complete communities. When we do that, we decrease uh, both the tax burden and we also decrease the social draw. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. For Mr. Magliocca, um, it's something that we did already address a little bit, but the taxation and the $52 million surplus was the number one concern in a survey that you did conduct. So how do you plan on addressing these concerns? Well, I uh, mentioned it earlier, how I plan to uh, conduct it is uh, give the money back to the people where it belongs. It's uh, not a surplus. And uh, over door not getting over a bunch of homes here, and that's all we keep hearing was uh, the $52 million should go back to the people, it should not be spent. 
on uh, on uh, the flood victims and all. But I, if they want to donate to the flood victim, let them make that choice. Uh, we did a dog and pony show for about four or five months. Uh, where the money's supposed to go, we're going to keep it here. We're going to be there. At the end of the day, the big majority of the people wanted them back, and they still took it. Thank you, Mr. Maglioka. Mr. Doham, making improved access to the new Northwest community, Evanston, is a key part of your platform. So how do you plan to fix this community's concern? By being a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. By lobbying for the citizens, by getting it done, by not taking no for an answer from the developers, by getting it done, by constantly lobbying using the province, getting together with people who are involved, and getting it done. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Wong, so your campaign is Do the Right Things and Do Things Right. Um, some of the issues were transportation and transit, such as traffic flow, congestion, uh, Crow Child tra Trail, and 10th Street, as well as the length of traffic travel. Um, so how do you plan to address these issues? If you uh, take a look at my website, the fundamental statement I make there is to reenact the principle of free flow and traffic. The principle of free flow and traffic basically says we try to remove as many impediments as possible by providing capacity, by providing the appropriate infrastructure. So as an example, on the case of the 10th Street area where people going downtown and coming home from work, a simple lane reversal going downtown and lane reversal coming back will move a lot more traffic in and out of downtown core a lot faster and provide a secondary... Thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank you. Um, so that ends um, the questions for tonight. So at this time, I'd like to provide each of our candidates one minute to close out our evening. And we will do it um, again in the same order. And so I will start with Mr. Ripley. I'd like to first off say uh, thank you to Civic Camp for putting on this war. Uh, it's not something that uh, they have to do. It's something that is uh, uh, put together on a, on a volunteer basis, and it gives everybody a chance to actually hear from the candidates and to assess uh, not only their platforms and what they will do for the city, but also to see how they will actually uh, address things in the public forum. I'm the only candidate, I believe, at this table that can provide the bridge that we need to see to move this city forward. That bridge is with the citizens, the development community, and City Hall itself. We've heard a lot about not working with developers, holding developers' feet to the fire. I agree with these things. However, it's about bringing everybody into the discussions and working out the solutions together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ripley. <laughs> Mr. Michael Oka? No. Uh, thank you also for you, uh, your folks uh, taking the you know, uh, time to come from your busy schedule coming out here and uh, listening to the candidates here. Uh, one thing I'd like to do too is I'd like to open up a uh, ward team office uh, somewhere in the ward, which I think is really important. Um, first of all, you know, get the people to come down uh, to City Hall to get a day off work or an afternoon or morning. Take the LRT down there and the work fine parking. So I, I think the candidates should be very transparent in the community and uh, have an office there where, you know, once a week, and it's there for about three or four hours, and people come and visit, have a coffee, and have a chat, and see what's going on in the city council. Uh, that's my commitment, was to open up an office in War Two, exactly where my office is now, Ranch Lines. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dohan. Uh, before I conclude, I'd like to thank the other candidates for putting their names forward and for actually showing up tonight. Democracy is about having a choice. Folks, you have a choice. And as well, remember the name of the candidate who did not show up tonight. If they did not show up tonight, do you think they will show up and fight on your behalf if elected? Um, we have some great candidates. Do your research. Check your value system. Do they align with your values? Can you trust them? Are they going to get the job done? And do they live here? 
You know what? I would do three things for the city of Calgary if elected. I'll keep property tax increases below 5%. I'm going to get better taxi service for the city of Calgary. I'll fight the taxi industry. I'll be a pain in the, for them. But most of all, I'm going to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dohan. Mr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, uh, coming out tonight. And thank you to the candidates for being here. Um, I'm going to be, be very quick about this non-residency issue. Non-residency issue is not a, not a concern, and it shouldn't be a concern to you. What's more important is you want somebody who understands you, knows the issues, knows the ge geography, and most importantly, knows how to navigate City Hall and gets things done. That is the most important thing. Second thing, that you're probably wondering why I'm wearing um, buttons here with uh, Mary Menchie and, and the three. My journey starting here, starting this election, started back in February. Started the discussions I had with Mayor Nancy about Ward 2 specific issues. What was it that we needed to provide continuity of, of, of experience, maturity, and service? Having a discussion, I took a look around and see if there was candidates out here that could serve Ward 2 properly. At the end of the day, I took the purple button off and I put the green button on, the green button on three. What are those three inspiring things that we could do to serve the people of Calgary and the people in Northwest? For the people Thank you, Mr. Wong. I apologize. Thank you. That's your time. All right. Thanks, everyone. You always sneak away, and I'm never looking. Sorry about that. So at this time, I'd like to thank all the candidates for your time today and your patience. I know the second half was a little rough, rough so thank you for your <laughs> patience with that and for sharing your ideas as well. And I'd also like to thank Civic Camp and all the citizens who put forward their questions, including yourselves tonight, and um, as well as all of our sponsors, our, um, the media sponsors, the universities in the city, and um, again, I'd just like to thank all of you guys for coming out tonight to learn a little bit more about your candidates. And just remember, Civic Camp is also hosting um, all the other forums around the city, so you can check our civiccamp.org for the dates and details. And I'd also like to thank Arts Vote Calgary. Christine at the back will be handing out information on the candidate's position on arts in the city. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you for my supporters, and that is our time for tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>